Good evening, and welcome to Church of the Cross's Wednesday night teaching. We're coming from the chapel at the Cross School's campus, and my name is Lisa Cerisi, and I'm a professor of art history. I specialize in sacred and devotional arts of the early Christian period and the Middle Ages. And I'm very happy to be back here for part two of our three-part teaching series. And those of you who may have attended my teaching before realize that... Uh, I go by the university clock, means that my teachings tend to be about an hour and 20 minutes, maybe an hour and a half. But the beauty of this stream is that you can come and go as you please. If you need to take a break, please do so. I'll probably still be talking about the same thing when you come back, and I'll never know that you left the screen. But seriously, um, I'm glad that you're tuning in tonight, and I'm happy to be sharing with you something I'm very passionate about. And for part two here, Tonight, we're going to be covering the imperial sanction, meaning the time Constantine legalizes Christianity, becomes a great patron of the arts, and then a little bit beyond. So remember part one, we covered the catacombs and the time of persecution. Now, there will be some transition taking place, and often I'll reference some of the earlier material, but you need not have viewed the first in order to be able to follow the second part. So what I'm showing you here up on the screen right now is a portrait of Constantine. I discussed this a little bit last time, and we said this was a colossal statue, eight and a half feet high, which was attached to a larger frame, an entire body. But it gives us a visual of the emperor who forever changed the history of Western civilization. Our next slide, I'm going to briefly address the battle at the Milvian Bridge on the 28th of October in 312. Constantine will confront his rival, Maxentius. And against all odds, Constantine is going to emerge victorious. And soon after, he's going to emerge as the sole emperor of Rome. For a short time, Rome was ruled by four. Now with Constantine, he's going to emerge once again as an only ruler. But you see, there's more to this story because on the eve of that battle, Constantine had a dream. And in that dream, he heard a voice. And the voice told him, in this conquer, or as it's been translated, in this sign thou shalt conquer. The sign was the chi, the first letter in Greek in Christ's name. Now Constantine understood the association with the Christ, and according to the account, the next morning, before going into battle, he had his soldiers emblazon that sign, that symbol, on their military shields, and the military standard that they would go into battle with. And as we know, against all odds, Constantine emerged victorious. And he attributed that victory to the Christ. Now, soon after that victory, Constantine will declare an edict that will tolera tolerate all religions, Christianity and others. And I'm going to show you a passage of that in a moment. But what I also want to address on this slide here is this monument here. Those of you who may have visited the city of Rome, you have maybe come across the Arch of Constantine. This was erected immediately after the emperor's victory over Maxentius. And there's an inscription up here in what's called the Attic, which the Senate approved of, and it notes in translation that it was by divine intervention that Constantine was able to defeat his enemy, the enemy being Maxentius. And that divine intervention, as I said, Constantine would attribute to the Christ. So what's happening here is Constantine is going to embrace the Christ. He's still going to worship all the Roman gods, but he's going to give a special place to Christ. Almost as though he's going to supersede all the other Roman deities. Now here's the passage from the Edict of Milan that was proclaimed by Constantine and Licinius. Now Licinius is over there in the eastern part of the Roman world. And eventually, Constantine will eliminate Licinius and, as I said, emerge as the sole emperor. But this passage here is very important. No one whatsoever should be denied the opportunity to give his heart to the observance of the Christian religion or that religion which he should think best for himself. Now, the passage goes on. However, this singles out Christianity in particular. Constantine is going to embrace the Christian faith. So much so that he's going to continue to use that symbol that appeared to him in the blazing sunlight in that dream, and he's going to incorporate it into his military standard. 
So what I'm showing you here on this slide is a reconstruction of what that military standard looked like according to the description that Constantine's biographer, Eusebius, presents for us. And this over here is an upright staff. It was crossed by a transverse to make the shape of a cross or a tau. Tau is a Greek letter, which also, by shape, symbolized the cross. But most important, above that, in a gold wreath, was surmounted the initials, the chi and the rho. The rho is the second letter in Greek of the name Christ. Clearly, Constantine has adopted the Christ and has placed him above even the portrait of Constantine himself showing that Constantine is now working through the divine intervention of the Christ. And this was the military standard that he would bring into battle, even after his victory at the Milvian Bridge. Now, in Eusebius's description of that standard of the cross, which is now known as the labarum right there, he also tells us that the emperor constantly made use of this as a sign of salvation a safeguard against every adverse and hostile power. Whoever was his enemy, or as he also saw it, the enemy of the church, he would use that as a sign of salvation in the face of that enemy. Shortly after the victory and the proclamation, the Edict of Milan, Constantine would have these medallions and coins circulate throughout the empire. And that was typical for an emperor to have coins and medallions circulating. On one side, there would be the portrait. And what's very interesting here, in this portrait of Constantine, he wears his armor, but right there at the crest of his helmet, once again, we have the chi and the rho. Right? He has adopted the Christ as a sign of salvation, the safeguard against the hostile powers. And he still had some enemies that he needed to get out of the way, including Licinius before he could emerge as the sole ruler of Rome. The other thing I want to point out with this silver medallion is the staff over here. Now, emperors would often be shown with their staff. It was a symbol of Roman power and authority as the first among all citizens of Rome. However, this staff here takes the shape, once again, of a cross or the tau. And then on top of that is an orb surmounting it. And if I would just briefly go back to our previous slide here of the labarum, this circle here, this wreath, is like a victor's wreath. It's encircling the chi and the rho, symbolizing the victory of the Christ as it surmounts even the portrait of Constantine there. There's a whole new way of understanding these symbols and these initials that are starting to come together in the context now of an emperor who has begun to embrace the Christian faith. A few years later, after he gets Licinius out of the way, he then starts to circulate these types of coins, they're called, it's called a, a, a numis, which is just of a lower value, like a penny. On one side would be the portrait of the emperor, as we have here, the laurel wreath on his head, an inscription, Constantine, the great Augustus. So Augustus was the title granted to the emperors, beginning with Octavian, who then gets the name Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. So that was the tradition. But it's on the reverse side, where we once again see that military standard, the labarum, depicted. Here's the upright pole. There's the cloth that had the portrait of Constantine and his two sons. And surmounting that at the top there, the chi and the rho once again, the first two letters in Greek of the name Christ. There's an inscription, space, publica, hope of the state. And then down here, the first four letters in the name Constantine. The staff over here of that labarum is impaling a serpent. The serpent symbolizes the enemy, the enemy of Constantine. And that enemy was understood as Licinius, who he got out of the way, defeated, but also the enemy of the church overall. It means those who persecuted Christians and those who will yet persecute Christians right, in, in, in uh, subsequent battles down the road. Now, there's another level of meaning to this, which, you know, by today's standards, we look at something like this and we really don't understand the complexity of meaning that's manifest in bringing together these symbols. But what we have here is Constantine asserting that he was God's elected leader for this new period of promise 
It combines the Roman military power united with Christianity. The message was clear. The emperor's armies will defeat its enemies with the help of the Christian God. And that differs from the way that Roman emperors who embraced the Roman state religion, the paganism, would have themselves depicted among the gods. Constantine is taking a place below the Christ. In other words, Christ surmounts him. And that message was loud and clear. The serpent, in addition to, again, representing the enemies of Constantine, also references the biblical antichrist. The serpent who tempts Adam and Eve to eat the fruit from the forbidden tree, the center of the garden. But also the serpent referenced by Isaiah, the Leviathan, and the one that's yet to come in Revelation, the Antichrist. So in other words, the, the serpent here takes on a theological role and a cosmic role as well. All right. We'll move on to this image here. It's known as the monogram of Constantine. And what it consists of, once again, is the chi, like you see here, intersected by the row, the first two letters in the Greek name for Christ, and that is now circled by the laurel wreath, the crown, the victor's crown. So it's a way of taking those symbols or letters, arranging them in a new way, putting that victor's crown, which comes right out of the classical Greek and Roman tradition, in combination to, once again, declare or communicate the victory of Christ over all other deities. Here we have suspended from one terminal, the alpha. Over here, a lowercase omega. The message is clear. Christ, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Victorious, triumphal over the old pagan ways. All right. We're going to see that surfacing throughout the next few centuries. What I'm going to show you now is a map because we have a little bit of history to outline here before we could start looking at some of the monuments. Right over here, the city of Rome, right? The heart and soul of the old Roman world. But what happens shortly after Constantine emerges as the sole emperor of Rome, he's going to move the capital from Rome all the way over here to a little port city known as Byzantium. And he's going to rename that city after himself, the city of Constantine, Constantinople. And from the onset, Constantinople is going to evolve as an imperial Christian state. In other words, Constantine is going to make sure that there are churches, there are court workshops, there are um, places where books are going to be produced in order to spread the Christian faith. So that section of the Roman Empire is now going to flourish from the onset as an imperial sponsored Christian state. Meanwhile, back in Rome, Constantine and his mother Helena, who we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, they are going to sponsor the building of churches. And some of those churches are going to be on some very significant sites or sites that were significant to the Christians. And I'll point those out when we look at another map in a few moments. Here's just a brief timeline to review the information, right? We said by 324, Constantine is going to rule as the sole emperor. By 330, he moves the capital from Rome to that port city, names it after himself, Constantinople. Now, once Christianity is legalized, you know, Constantine wants to get in good with the Christians, right? He wants to cover all his bases here. And he decides to start what we call the ecumenical movement. Where in the year 20, 325, he starts the councils. The councils that brought church leaders from all those Christian communities together, where they could flesh out the definitive position of the Orthodox Church on its doctrine and theology. Constantine himself will preside at the Council of Nicaea. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few moments, the content of the creed that comes out of that council in 325. By 337, Constantine is baptized a Christian shortly after he dies. So we say Constantine was baptized on his deathbed. That was the practice in the early church, right? One would be baptized shortly before dying that tradition would change, right, as Christianity would evolve and continue to grow. Now, after Constantine dies, the next emperor that steps up is Theodosius. Now, Theodosius will preside in the imperial palace in Constantinople, and he will officially make Christianity the religion of the empire, and that happens around 380. Then we have to also realize we're going to be talking about the time period when Rome 
will fall. And what we mean by that is when Rome is repeatedly sacked by these Germanic tribes that are going to be sweeping across the map with their eye set on the city of Rome, sort of to teach it a lesson. And the first time that happens is in the year 410. Alaric, who's a Visigoth, one of the Germanic tribes of people, again, moving through the boundaries of the Roman world and basically leaving a wake of destruction in its path, looting, pilfering, rioting, burning down the cities. And Rome is defeated in a sense. And what's interesting is when you start to read accounts written by people who lived at the time, who were witnessing this. And one account that we get from Jerome, St. Jerome, who's one of the early church fathers, he's at this time in the city of Jerusalem, living in a cave, a grotto, actually he's in Bethlehem, living in a grotto next to the church of the nativity, where he is translating the Bible from the Hebrew into the Latin. And he writes very famously about Rome, the city which had taken the whole world was itself taken. Now you can imagine what the people were thinking right, when Rome was being repeatedly sacked. A few decades later, Attila the Hun would threaten the city of Rome. But very famously, Leo the Great was a bishop of Rome, the Pope. He meets Attila. And Leo was, not only was he, was he a caring pastor and protecting his flock of Christians, but he was a man of peace. And he somehow was able to convince Attila to retreat. So Attila never attacked the city of Rome. But the Vandals would devastate it around the year 455. So Rome would be, again, experiencing a series of vicious attacks, the damage and the destruction, and yet the Christian church would persevere in Rome. All right, what we're going to do now is um, go back to the ecumenical movement, and we're going to talk about that first council of Nicaea. Remember, the one in which Constantine himself presided. And the first council was held in 325, and what comes out of that most famously is the Nicene Creed. Now, the Nicene Creed may not be the first creed. First creed may have been the Apostles' Creed, but the content is essentially the same. The doctrine and the theology that's codified in this in order to respond to the heresies that were circulating throughout the Christian communities make it very clear what the official position of the church was. And that creed would reaffirm the divinity of Jesus the homoousius, meaning that Jesus was of the same substance as God the Father. Because there were some heretical groups that were denying the divinity of Jesus. They just believed he was the firstborn, but did not share the same substance with God the Father. So the creed makes that very clear. Another council I'm going to mention is that in Constantinople in 381. So after the time of Constantine, the councils would still meet in order to, once again, address the heresies that were spreading throughout the Christian world. And that had to do with the Holy Spirit and addresses the Trinity. The triune deity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three persons inseparable. So it made clear the divinity of the Holy Spirit. A little bit later, we'll have a council meeting in Ephesus in 431, which would address the unity of Christ, his divine and human nature. And in so doing, they're going to declare Mary the bearer of God. The teotokos is the Greek word we use for it. So in other words, it reaffirms that Christ was both divine and human in the face of, again, heresies that denied that. And in so doing, it puts Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the position as the vessel chosen by divinity through which grace would be dispensed upon humankind. So in other words, she gave birth to Jesus. And we're going to see how the churches are going to respond to all of this doctrine. Much of it, again, is reaffirmed in the creed. And that creed, as many of you are familiar with, is recited during the liturgical services, right, for many of the major churches, even today. And it's also the content that's going to be represented on the walls inside churches once they are uh, being built. One other uh, council that I'll mention is that at Chalcedon in 451, because that's going to confirm the two distinct natures of Christ. In other words, we understand that he's divine and he's human, but what is the nature of that? And what it confirms in the Orthodox, one holy Catholic and apostolic tradition is that Jesus had two distinct natures, both divine and human, but in one person. 
And we call that the hypostatic union. And again, much of that was being refuted or rejected or renounced by some of the heretical factions. The Nicene Creed, very briefly, I have it outlined here with some passages that are going to be referenced here. Let me get my laser going. All right, and this would be something that came out of baptismal creeds. This would be something that would be recited by those being baptized into the Christian faith. And the reason I, I've outlined this is because the content here is essentially going to provide the basis for the subject matter represented inside the churches when they're built. See, most of society was illiterate. They couldn't read. So pictures will play a very important role, especially those displayed on the walls of the churches that are going to be built in this generation. The idea that there's only one God, creator of heaven and earth, one begotten son, who is consubstantial with the Father, meaning true God from true God. He's not the firstborn, but he is consubstantial with the Father. For our salvation, he came down from heaven, the Holy Spirit, right? he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and he became man. Crucified unto Pontius Pilate. It dates it historically. The idea that he suffered a death addresses once again his human nature. He suffered that death. Rose again on the third day, and that's the fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascends into heaven, and he will come again, judgment day. This passage here addresses the Trinity, right? the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and Son is adored and glorified. And again, the reason I'm pointing this out, many of you are familiar with it, but this is going to provide the basis for the subject matter that we're going to see inside the churches, along with the narratives from the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. And then the creed, ends with the lines of confession in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And when you take such complex theology and doctrine like that, how are you going to lend it into pictures? How is that going to transition? Are they going to work that out in this time period, right, of the sort of the close of the 4th century into the 5th and the 6th centuries? And as all of this is playing out in Rome, where these huge churches are going to be built, we have to remember, Rome is being repeatedly attacked, yet the church perseveres. All right, the next slide I'm showing you here is a map. And this is of the city of Rome. And right over here, we have the Tevere, the Tiber River, which cuts through the city of Rome. And what this shows is essentially how Rome is beginning to transition from a pagan city to an early Christian one. And some of the monuments here, just to give us a sense of where things are located, right over here is the Colosseum, that great amphitheater given to the uh, Romans by Vespasian. The Forum in this area over here. There's the Arch of Constantine. So it's all clustered around each other. But we're interested in sites like this over here. The enormous church that Constantine is going to build for the Christians over the grave of Peter. Remember, Peter, the apostle to the city of Rome. St. Peter's. Today, the current structure there, St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, is a replacement that was built in the 16th and 17th centuries. But Constantine had arranged for a basilica to be constructed right on the graveside of Peter. In addition to that, if we move across the city of Rome, over here, there'll be another church built by Constantine for the Christians. And that will be the Lateran Basilica. And I'll explain these in detail when I get to the pictures, but I just want to give you an idea of what Constantine is doing, what he's giving to the Christians, along with his mother Helena, who may have actually been a Christian even before Constantine. This church over here, it's called the Church of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem. Even though it's in the city of Rome, it gets the name in Jerusalem. And we're going to see what this church looks like today, but I'm going to give you a little bit of the history about that in the time of Constantine and his mother. Over here, a little bit after Constantine's time, a church dedicated to St. Mary, the mother of Jesus, St. Mary Major. So what you're getting an idea, again, is how Rome is going to transition from a pagan city into a Christian one. The next map I show you here, actually two maps, include the catacombs, because last time we talked at great length about the catacombs. And what's going to happen to some of them, if we look at this map over here first, the catacombs of St. Sebastian, Domitilla, Callisto, if we move up here, Along the Via Saladia, we have that of Priscilla, which we looked at in detail last time, that of St. Um, Agnes. Constantine is also going to commission churches to be built over some of these catacombs, enormous basilicas. 
The other one that I want to mention appears on this map here, and it's along the Via Ostiense, a basilica that will be built in honor of Paul, which marks the place where Paul was buried, Paul being the other disciple to, uh, or apostle to uh, spread Christianity in the city of Rome. Both Peter and Paul were persecuted, most likely during the reign of Nero. Nero commits suicide by, what, the year 68, 69? So sometime before then, um, Peter and Paul were martyred and buried. And then in the time of Constantine, these enormous churches built on their gravesides. So here's a list of the basilicas. And I'll explain what a basilica is in a moment. That were built during the time of Constantine. This is just in the city of Rome. We haven't even discussed what's going on in the Holy Land or in Constantinople. Today's material is going to focus primarily on Rome. So what it'll have is a church built in the Lateran area, which will become, in the time of Constantine too, the Cathedral of Rome. Even today it's the cathedral. And we refer to that as the um, San Giovanni in Laterano, the basilica there. A church over St. Peter's grave, a church over St. Paul's, one over St. Lawrence, who was buried outside the walls. Remember, all of those grave sites were outside the walls of the Aurelian um, map of Rome. The Church of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, that's inside the walls, right? Because it's not associated with a burial. St. Sebastian outside, because that marks the catacombs. I mean, the point here is to, to realize just how much church building, it's flourishing in this time period. And with the exception of the last here, St. Mary Major, all of these here are associated with Constantine's time and his mother, Helena. For tonight's purposes, I'm going to combine those that um, Helena and Constantine commissioned together rather than sort out who did what. We'll just refer to them as the Constantinian and Helena churches. St. Mary Major would come uh, later on. A basilica was a Roman type of construction. And I'll con address that with the next slide here. All right, so what I'm showing you here is a diagram of the basilica that was built in the Lateran region of Rome. And the basilica was a, a Roman construction, very utilitarian. It was sort of like a rectangular building, and the short end could terminate end in a semicircular space, like an apse. In Roman days, a portrait of the emperor would be put there. When the Christians start building basilicas, that apse section would be the sanctuary, the high altar, where the altar table would be set, where the Eucharist would be celebrated. It's an easy transition. They continue what the Romans built, but they modify it to suit the Christian worship services. A basilica generally has a higher roof down the center aisle, and that's called the nave. And you can see the columns would support the nave wall and the roof. So the basilica was a type of building that comes out of the Roman tradition. But when the Christians start to use the term basilica, it may or may not physically look like the Roman basilica, the rectangular plan, because a basilica in the Christian tradition has a certain status. The building could be round, but it's still called a basilica. It's a special status awarded that particular church, and it's usually associated with a pilgrimage church. So in other words, that list of churches that I just showed you in the previous slide actually are the seven major pilgrimage churches or basilicas in the city of Rome that were popular by the 5th century and continue even today to be popular pilgrimage destinations for tourists. Now getting back to the um, church that was first dedicated to the Holy Savior, meaning dedicated to Christ, and a little bit later to John the Baptist and John the Evangelist, which is why today it's referred to as St. John Lateran or San Giovanni in Laterano, as the Italians refer to it. That was Constantine's first imperial Christian building. It's the first he ever gave to the Christians. Now, before the church was built, it was actually a uh, palace that was built by the pagan Roman emperors. Constantine inherited that land when he became the sole emperor, and he then donated it to the Christians. It became the official residency for the Bishop of Rome. The church was built as the official seat of the bishop, which makes it the cathedral. And that's what the cathedral means. It's the seat of the bishop. Even today, that church, San Giovanni in Laterano, is the official cathedral of Rome. You know, many people are confused. They think St. Peter's Basilica, the heart of Vatican City, is the cathedral. It's not. That's actually a martyrium, which marks the grave of Peter. But in any case, that Basilica dedicated to the Holy Savior was consecrated on the 9th of November in the year 3, er, 318. 
that building has changed significantly since the Constantinian building. And we have to realize that after this was built, you know, we have those Germanic tribes sweeping into the city of Rome, pilfering, looting, sacking, setting things on fire. But the Christians are going to rebuild it, right? Each subsequent pope tries to rebuild those churches, adding to it throughout the ages. What it looks like today is pictured here. The facade that you see there, the front, actually dates to the time of the 17th century. It was made to harmonize with the current front of the current St. Peter's. So stylistically, it belongs to, they say, the 17th century. But it gives us a visual, right, of one of the major pilgrimage churches in in Rome even today. What's interesting about the history of this precinct, where that church was situated and built in Constantine's time, St. Helena, Constantine's mother, was canonized by the church, so we refer to her as St. Helen or St. Helena. She made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land between 326 and 328. And while she was over there in the Holy Land, she visited Jerusalem as well. She arranged to have a flight of steps Removed, marble steps removed from what was believed to be the Praetorium of Pilate, the steps that Jesus ascended when he was placed on trial. Those steps were removed, according to tradition, from Jerusalem and brought to the city of Rome, where they were then incorporated into the precinct, the buildings that occupied this area. Those steps today, there's 28 of them, are still available for pilgrims to crawl up in a very penitential way, like you see here, pictured by a group of nuns. And as they're crawling up those steps, they're able to contemplate on the passion and the suffering of Christ. And such was the tradition since the Middle Ages. You know, these steps here, it's a very interesting photograph because it shows the marble. See, those marble steps by the year 1723 were so worn down that the Pope at the time, I believe it was um, Innocent the Thirteenth, he had the steps encased in wood. As you see here, these wooden panels, these were being removed, I think it was about two years ago, in 2018. A decision was made to remove the wood that preserved those marble steps since 1723. The wood was removed, the marble steps were examined, They were repaired and they were cleaned. And they were exposed for one year for pilgrims to once again crawl up. And there you see a picture of what the steps look like once those wooden boards were removed. This photograph here shows them cleaned. And as I said, the steps were exposed for one year and I believe it was in June in 2019 where they were covered with the wooden boards again. See, had not Innocent the uh, 13th covered those steps in 1723, there would probably be nothing left of that marble. They are so worn down from all those pilgrims right, who would ascend them on their knees in a very pious way as they contemplated on the passion. Now, you know, people will ask me often, well, are those really the steps that Jesus walked upon? We don't know with any certainty. However, what is interesting, the marble does indeed come from Jerusalem, or at least what the Romans would have left behind when they built up the city of Jerusalem. And archaeologists today will tell you that the steps of that praetorium, of that monument in Jerusalem, are indeed missing. So whether they are the actual steps or not, we don't know. But just the idea that Helena would arrange for something from the Holy Land to be brought back to Rome is fascinating. You know, those who lived in the West could not afford uh, the time or the money to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So the idea was to bring something back for them. And in so doing, spread Christianity. This is happening in the fourth century. So that was, again, a second, or should I say, the first major monument commissioned by Constantine and his mother. The other one was, or I should say another one, was the basilica that was built over the grave of St. Peter. And here's a uh, picture of what that looked like. It no longer exists because a new structure in 16th and 17th century replaced this. And what we have here, once again, is essentially a basilica, enormous in size. So you can see the length of the nave here, plus this atrium, a little closed-in garden with a fountain in the middle. The length of that was about 653 feet. I mean, that is enormous. You think about it in terms of the size of a football field. 
It follows, for the most part, the Roman Basilica, but the Christians added a new feature. This here, it's called a transept. It intersects the nave at a right angle, gives them additional space. As the Christian liturgy and the worship was evolving, it required more space. So they add new parts of a building to that basilica. In this cutaway view, let me see if I can zoom in on this here, right there. Right over here at the crossing where the transept and the nave intersect, directly underneath that, Constantine arranged to have a little canopy or a baldachin erected because that baldachin directly underneath there marks the grave of Peter. And I'm going to show you another slide in a moment, as soon as I unzoom here. There we go. And incidentally, that basilica, we could refer to it as Old St. Peter's because the new St. Peter's would replace it in the 16th and 17th century. But Constantine's church was dedicated on the 18th of November in 333. Here's a reconstruction drawing of that crossing in Constantine's church. There's the apse, which would have been the focal point where the high altar was placed. But in the crossing there is this little canopy, like you see here. Directly underground, directly underneath that, was a chamber. And above the chamber was like a little monument, which in Constantine's time, Christians believed to be the grave of Peter. And what this reconstruction shows here is a split floor level. So you have here, and then a flight of steps that you could descend, then to go down to another level. And just to give you an idea, the uh, walls of old St. Peter's were nine feet thick. When Constantine's church was dismantled, parts of those walls were incorporated into the new construction. In fact, they provide the foundation for it. Just to give you an idea of just the, the sheer size of this. Now, directly below that canopy, Constantine had seen this here. And this is a reconstruction, obviously, of, of the original, but it's what we call a tropion. And that's a Greek word that means trophy. But really, it's like a commemorative monument. And what it commemorated was the location of Peter's grave. That monument was most likely erected at some time, maybe around the year 190, 200. And for those Christians who followed Peter and the ones to come after that weren't buried in catacombs, many of them would be buried next to this monument because they wanted to be buried together as one Christian family, a community. Like today, we have graveyards at churches or a columbarium where the deceased from a church family come together. It was no different for the early Christians during the time of persecution that they wanted to be buried together. So if they weren't being buried in, in um, catacombs, right, many of them wanted to be buried near Peter. And what we have essentially beneath St. Peter's Basilica is an Acropolis. And within that city of the dead was Peter's tomb, surrounded by the tombs of other Christians. But you see, Constantine, he didn't demolish that structure that was built at least 100 years before he financed the construction of this church. He incorporated it into the new plan. Now, it would have been much easier for Constantine to build the church in a different location. But he chose this location because it was important for the Christians. And in order to do this, he had to have about a million tons of soil relocated in order to prep the land, to flatten it. That's how important it was for them to build upon that site. This slide here, I hope, helps you better understand the relationship between what's above ground, and even today, and what's below ground. So down here would be the tomb of Peter. Here is that tropion, the monument that Constantine right, incorporated into his structure. Part of it was exposed in Constantine times. Part of it was below a ground. If you look at the diagram here, you could see the floor of Constantine's church there. And then what's going to happen in subsequent centuries, the levels are going to increase. In other words, moderations, or I should say uh, alterations and modifications are going to be made by subsequent popes. So this whole section here is going to be changed. But what will remain consistent from the time of Constantine to today's present altar, 
is that that high altar is directly over the tomb. You know, what's even more fascinating is that the Vatican in the 1930s was doing routine um, alterations, repairs, and excavations in that area, and they uncovered a chamber. And in that chamber were human remains. A few years later, archaeologists decided to study it further. And they discovered that the skeletal remains that they located in that chamber were of a male, about 60 to 70 years old, who was of stocky built. It actually fits the description of Peter. But in addition to that, they found, let me go back to this um, slide here for a moment. On this red wall, plaster wall, there was an inscription, graffiti. And that graffiti, even though it was damaged, it was still legible, the graffiti indicated Peter is within. And that graffiti dates to the time of the construction of this monument here. So maybe 100 years or less after Peter was buried. And that would have been a way that, you know, Christians could tell other generations of Christians where Peter's grave was. Okay. So moving along, just again to give you a sense of, of how things lined up, especially for those of you who've been to the current Basilica of St. Peter's, all right, there's an elaborate baldachin, enormous structure, the high altar there, all in these black lines. And then this red section here refers to the Vatican grottos that were constructed after the time of Constantine. The blue section here corresponds to the necropolis, right, where Peter was buried, other Christians buried for the first 100, 200 years prior to Constantine. See, Constantine had to buy this land in order to build the church for the Christians. So he very cleverly chose that plot because he knew how important it was for them. Here's what St. Peter's looks like today in the interior with the high altar there, that baldachin that I pointed out. And this section here is called the confessio. You can descend into the confessio directly beneath that high altar. So here's the altar, all right, the mensa table. Directly below it inside the confessio is the access to Peter's tomb. This slide here shows once again the baldachin and then this section here being the grave of Peter. All right. This next slide just shows you the interior of St. Peter. So many of you have traveled to Rome. Many of you wrote to me in response to the first teaching lesson, what you were able to see, what you would like to see. You mentioned St. Peter's. Um, we're not going to be talking about the current St. Peter's. That belongs to a whole different teaching lesson. But I thought I would show you the interior of that, again, the way it looks today. Largely a product, again, of the 16th and 17th centuries. We're more interested in the early church. All right, so there's Constantine's church of old St. Peter's from the 4th century, and then the new one, as you can see, this aerial view of the complex, which again dates to the 15th, 16th centuries. And Constantine's not finished, right? With, even with the Lateran Basilica, we got old St. Peter's, and that dedicated to St. Paul, right? According to tradition, Paul was martyred. He was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. Beheading was considered more dignified than crucifixion. In any case, upon that grave of Paul... In 324, a small church was built in Constantine's time. That small church would be later dismantled, expanded to a larger church, that destroyed, right, when those Germanic tribes are coming into Rome and rebuilt and modified and updated a long history. We're not going to get into it all, but I'm just showing you the profile here. Because what exists here is largely reconstructed. But it gives us an idea of what Constantine's church of St. Peter looked like in terms of its layout, in terms of that courtyard in the front there's a statue of Peter holding a sword that becomes his attribute the instrument used for his martyrdom the type of gable roof there all of that right fits a very uh, similar profile to St. Peter's there's a closer view of it there's the interior and again what we're looking at on the inside today has been largely reconstructed the subject matter that would have appeared along the walls right, would have brought together events in the life of Paul with the events in the life of Jesus and, of course, reaffirming the doctrine and theology of the, of the creed. What I do want to point out, because this is incorporated into many church buildings, this back here, at the far end where the nave, this here, transitions into the sanctuary. It's what we call a triumphal arch motif. It comes out of the Roman tra tradition of triumphal arches, like the passageway right, that the Roman soldiers would process through upon an emperor's victory, like 
the Arch of Constantine. But now the Christians take that profile and they incorporate it in a modified way into the church to symbolize the triumph of Christ as it was celebrated in the Eucharist at the um, altar table there. There's the detail of it. And again, much of this has been all reconstructed. In the spandrels, we have figures of Peter and Paul. Remember, Peter and Paul received very specific assignments. Peter to spread the Christian faith among the Jewish people, Paul to the Gentiles. And they become very important for the church as it evolves in, in the city of Rome and throughout the West. Over here, we have a figure of Christ in majesty. Now, I showed you something similar to that in the catacombs. And this image comes out of the East, but eventually is incorporated into the programs, right, into the pictures of churches in, in the West when they're being built. Here, in this side, we have the martyrs robed in the white robes of righteousness, adoring the Christ who appears. And then above there, the symbols of the evangelist. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about that. I will actually address the symbols of the evangelist, the authors of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we get to the Carolingian, the final uh, part of this teaching series. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what the interior would have looked like, very richly decorated. You know, Constantine would have provided all the furnishings necessary for the Christian worship service. Everything of that was documented in a book, which we still have um, translations of today. Here shows the tomb of Paul, right, that as it appears today in a very different setting, but nevertheless marks that as well. And then when we go on the outside, a beautiful cloister garden that was added to in the 13th century. So again, you're looking at a building in and of itself, it's like a museum, but a living museum. Right? When you realize that many of these churches started in the time of Constantine, and even though they were modified and rebuilt and altered, um, have been in continuous use. Okay. The other, another major basilica that's commissioned in Constantine's time was that dedicated to Holy Cross, Santa Croce in Gerusalemme. And why we call it the Holy Cross in Jerusalem is because very interesting, um, part of the history or tradition behind this building is that Helena had arranged for soil, for earth, to be taken from Jerusalem and transported to Rome to provide the floor, the foundation for this structure. Now I'm showing you a picture of the way it looks today. Did not look like that back in Constantine's or Helen's time. This is an 18th century facade. But just the idea that it still incorporates, right, the, the soil, the foundation coming from Jerusalem is fascinating. What's also interesting about this particular church is Helena, when she was you know, on her pilgrimage, according to tradition, she discovered the true cross, meaning the cross upon which Jesus was crucified. And she took back to Rome with her a fragment of that cross, along with other relics associated with the passion of Christ. And they were incorporated into a chapel within this building as well. So if you go to Rome today and you happen to pop into the Basilica of Santa Croce and Jerusalem, you can see the chapel that houses relics associated with the passion of Christ. And what's even more fascinating, um, and it wasn't discovered until the 15th century, they uncovered a wooden board with an inscription of the word Nazarene on there in three different languages. And the claim was that that was the titulus that was placed above the head of Jesus, that Pilate ordered the soldiers. Right, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Whether or not it's the authentic piece of wood that was placed above the head of Jesus, identifying him as King of the Jews, we don't know. But once again, just the idea that it would have been brought back or something was brought back from, from uh, Jerusalem by Helen and incorporated into this complex. All right. So that covered Rome. Meanwhile, in the Holy Land, churches will be commissioned and financed and furnished by Constantine and his mother. Churches dedicated to the site where Jesus was crucified and resurrected. That's known as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, I'm not going to show you pictures of these. In fact, about a year ago, or a little more than a year ago, I gave a three-part series on the Holy Land, and I covered some of these in great detail. But I just want to give you an idea of all, again, the church building that's going on throughout the, the Roman world, now the Christian Roman world. And 
in addition to the church of the Holy Sepulchre, she establishes a church on the Mount of Olives. Now today, the Eliona, that refers to, um, the, the, today there's a church of the uh, Patenoster, the Our Father, believed to be a place where Jesus instructed his disciples, perhaps taught them the words of that prayer. In addition, the site of the Ascension. And this is all according to tradition, but if you go to the Holy Land today, you will see these monuments, or at least vestiges of them. Church of the Grotto of Bethlehem, all right, where, again, according to tradition, Jesus was born. So over that grotto was built an elaborate basilica in the time of, of Helena and Constantine. That church has been changed slightly over the years, but nevertheless remains in its same place. They also identified the spot near the Sea of Galilee where the miracle of the loaves and fish took place. Today, there's a Benedictine monastery there, Tapka. And inside of that modern structure, the old mosaics that date back to this early time period are revealed, fish and basket. Helena also confirmed the place where Jesus stood when he gave his Sermon on the Mount. Again, another elaborate structure there to mark that. And the place of the Annunciation in Nazareth, an enormous basilica. Now again, we don't know if these are the exact historically accurate sites, but according to tradition. Right? So again, if you go to the Holy Land and visit these, you will see these monuments associated with those events in the life of Jesus. So that's the Holy Land. In Constantinople, where the Imperial Palace is, he's got the Church of Holy Wisdom being built and a Church of the Holy Apostles. And again, I'm not going to show you pictures of these because really tonight's material is focusing on Rome. But the Church of Holy Wisdom, the one that was built by Constantine, that would be destroyed, sadly, but rebuilt by one of his successors, Justinian, in the 6th century. Eventually, what's going to happen to Constantinople, some of you may remember from history, it's going to be taken over by the Ottoman Turks in 1453. And the Byzantine Empire comes to an end. So the eastern half of the Roman world, which flourished as the Byzantine Empire, will come to that end. And the Church of uh, Hagia Sophia will be uh, modified into a mosque, whereas the Church of the Holy Apostles was completely destroyed. All right, back to Rome. One last basilica there, the Church of St. Mary Major, or Santa Maria Maggiore, um, dedicated to the Mother of Jesus. This church is built in response to the Council of Ephesus, which defined the unity of Christ, divine and human, and declared Mary the Theotokos a major construction. And if you think about the time, 431, when this was starting to be built, Rome was already sacked by Alaric and yet to be attacked. And yet the church perseveres. What you're looking at is a 17th century front here. All right, this would be called that the Baroque facade. But originally it would have had a, um, an early, say, basilica look to it, like what we saw at St. Paul's. Inside, an enormous nave, which leads down to the high altar, where once again we have that triumphal arch motif. Now, much of what you see covering the floors and the walls have all been replaced or restored, modified, fixed, updated. You know, we're looking at a church that was built in the 5th century and basically in continuous use. So it's going to need some repairs and updates, especially as Rome um, has a history of being looted and pilfered and destroyed. Originally, mosaics little glass cubes that were painted and arranged to make pictures, decorated the walls under the windows and on this back arch. The subject matter, Old Testament, New Testament narratives, and the most significant on this back wall here, here we're getting closer to the high altar. All this here dates to the fifth century and it is almost perfectly intact. The subject matter there on that so-called triumphal arch motif clearly reaffirms the content of the creed along with the divinity and humanity, the two natures of Jesus in one hypostatic union. And it goes from the narratives here of the Annunciation. There's the dove symbolizing the Holy Spirit descending upon Mary, who sits like a queen. The angel Gabriel announcing to Mary the message that she will bear the Son of God. And here's Joseph over here. Down here at this level, we have the Christ child seated on a throne by himself, the King of Kings. You know, the imagery here bears a resemblance to the imperial court. In other words, when they were coming up with, with, with how do we represent the subject matter? How do we represent Christ, King of Kings? 
the majesty. Well, they would look towards the imperial court, the etiquette, the decorum, the proper behavior and mannerism for that inspiration. So yeah, very often Christ looks like a king of this time period and Mary a queen. And there's a, a detail of that. If we see over here, go to the next slide. In a moment, we have the three magi following the star to the Christ child. And once again, they appear in Persian attire, the Phrygian hats, the tunics, and the leggings. It'll be a while before they're shown again with those types of crowns that we normally associate with the kings. But again, what was important about, you know, picturing this narrative, it reaffirms, right, that the Holy Spirit will come upon her, the power of the Most High will overshadow her. Jesus is incarnate, but he's the Son of God, consubstantial with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. So it, it reaffirms the Trinity as well. And all of that plays out in the mosaics on that back wall there of that triumphal arch. And there's just another detail of it. What I've also included are links to virtual tours of those churches in Rome. They've done a great job putting together all right, these websites where you can explore and zoom in. So if that's something you like to do, you can copy down these links and um, have fun with it. What I want to show you now is a sarcophagus, a stone coffin, which is going to go back a little bit in time to the year 359. And this was carved in Rome for Junius Bassus. He was a prefect of Rome, like a mayor, converted to Christianity. So a proper burial coffin was made for him. That's what a sarcophagus is, is a stone coffin. And what's interesting here is the way in which scenes from Old Testament and New Testament narratives are going to be depicted. One would expect things to unfold in a chronological order, but that doesn't happen. We saw that with the catacombs, and now we're seeing it when sarcophagi, that's the plural, are made. I'm going to point out some of the subject matter and then show you the details. Right here in the upper level, which is called a register, is an image of Christ as philosopher. Peter and Paul stand by him. Directly below is Jesus on a donkey, his entry into Jerusalem. If we were to go to this side of Christ's entry into Jerusalem, we have Adam and Eve, the moment when they're aware of their nakedness. They've sinned against God. To this side is Job, the story of Job most of us are familiar with. All those bad things that happened to him, all his riches and his family are taken away from him, but yet he never renounces his fate. And in the end, God rewards him for that steadfast faith. If we go to this side of the entry into Jerusalem, we get Daniel in the lion's den. Similar idea. Daniel remains faithful, unwilling to worship a false god, even if it meant facing death, thrown into a den of lions. But as we know, He's released unharmed. Prefiguration of the entombment and the resurrection. But over here we have the arrest of Paul. So you have Old Testament, New Testament coming together in no sequence that seems to make sense by today's standards. If we go above here, there's Christ as philosopher. We have the arrest of Christ. And then Christ brought before Pilate over here. To this side we have Paul, um, Peter arrested. And then the sacrifice that Abraham was willing to make with his son Isaac. Once again, it seems to be sort of random choosing and picking, but it's not. There's a very symbolic way that these stories are unfolding, and it has to do with the proximity, what's placed next to what, Old Testament, New Testament, typological pairing. I'm going to just go look at some of the details here for a moment and discuss the Christ as philosopher that you see here. All right, and here we have, we've seen that before in the catacombs, a youthful-looking Christ with a tunic, shaven. He's seated. He's got a scroll in his hand here, and he just gave a scroll to the figure of Peter. So you got Peter and Paul here. And what's very curious is this here. All right, sort of a half-length figure with a full beard, and he has this canopy over his head. And that's meant to be a personification of Chalus, of heaven. Jupiter, being the head god in Roman mythology, is represented in Roman art, usually with a canopy over him like that. 
symbolizing the great firmament of heaven, all that is contained in it, and it places Jupiter at the center. That was the, the Roman mythology. But you see, it's what Christ is doing here with his foot. It's almost like he's kicking him in the head. Or put another way, he's using the head of Jupiter as a footstool. You know, when philosophers were depicted in the Roman tradition, philosophers were usually shown, shown seated, sometimes even writing. But they had a footrest. I guess they had to prop up their feet because they sat so long. And here, too, Jesus is given that footrest. And I'm going to address that more in a moment. But what I want to do is focus on what's going on here with the scroll, right? Because the scroll symbolizes law, law of the church. And Jesus is transferring that law to Peter and Paul. Remember, we said that they had their assignments to spread the Christian faith among the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And that's established in Rome through, or the West, through the figures of, of Peter and Paul. That idea of transferring a document, a legal document, comes out of the Roman tradition of the traditio legis. But now it's given over to Christ, Christ the philosopher, the intelligent, the wise. Now getting back to this personification here of Chalus as Jupiter, the idea that Christ the philosopher has his footstool. But in this case, the footstool is made up by the old state religion, the pagan which was perceived of as an enemy of the church. Well, that brings to mind Psalm 110, where David writes, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Well, those enemies, those who persecuted the Christians, have now become the footstool. Put another way, it shows the triumph of Christianity over the old pagan ways. And that's, again, coming from Psalm 110, and from the New Testament, Gospel of Luke, and Acts. Or as I say to my students sometimes, if somebody's kicking you in the head, what kind of a message are they giving you? All right, that they've defeated you, that they conquered you. As we move about, I'll just show you some of the details. There's Christ's entry into Jerusalem. Now, most of you are familiar with the long narratives in the Gospel. However, only certain scenes or passages are chosen and depicted. The understanding is that one scene like this would call to mind the larger story. So in other words, Christ's entry into Jerusalem marks the beginning of his passion, the passion cycle itself. Now on the upper register, we had Christ here holding a scroll. So once again, he's shown like a philosopher. And notice he's not shown beaten, tired, wounded, but rather upright and dignified. They're very uncomfortable showing Christ suffering at this point. They didn't deny it. They're just uncomfortable showing it. And there are the Roman soldiers. Here's Pilate washing his hands in a basin. Interestingly enough, what we don't have is the crucifixion. They're very uncomfortable depicting the crucifixion at this time. Instead, Christ brought before Pilate implied it. Moving throughout, there's the arrest of Peter. To this side, there's Abraham there's his little son Isaac with his hands bound behind his back. The knife there is broken, but remember the angel of the Lord appears and tells him you have proven your fear, your love of God, sacrifice this ram instead. So that whole covenant that God made with Abraham is in a very abbreviated way depicted by this one scene. Here we have Job seated on a dunghill. Remember all his possessions, all his family are taken away from him, yet he remains faithful to God. Over here, we have Adam and Eve. And the moment depicted is when they realize their nakedness. They've eaten, eaten the fruit from the forbidden tree. There's the serpent coiled around the trunk. And they're aware that they've sinned against God. That's the moment that's depicted here. That scene, the fall from grace, is right next to Christ's entry into Jerusalem. And just to give you an idea again of the way these are paired, because you may think it's just random, but if this is the origin of sin... That which is responsible for the remission of sins is Christ's passion. So in other words, the entry here into Jerusalem symbolizes the blood shed on the cross for the remission of sins and sins yet to come. The original sins that, again, come from the narrative of Adam and Eve. So they're paired typologically, symbolically, in ways that the modern viewer could probably not understand unless they took a course in theology of Old Testament, New Testament pairing. Here are just some more of the scenes. We talked about Daniel in the lion's den. 
right? And he emerges unharmed. And there, the arrest of Paul. So collectively, the scenes, the way in which they're paired, once again, is symbolic. But they also collectively communicate a message and provide a virtue, right, of patience and faith, even in the face of persecution, right? So it's a moralizing lesson. And there's the sarcophagus from a different angle. You know, one of the questions that I often get from students is that why does... Christian art looks so different from, say, the art of ancient Rome. You know, when we look at this bust portrait here of the Roman emperor Vespasian, right, you look at the level of skill there, and you realize just how talented the carvers were. They're able to capture the lifelikeness of an individual man. The signs of age, the wrinkles on his forehead, the hairstyle, receding hairline perhaps, bags under his eyes, caliper lines, crow's feet, sagging jaw lines, sunken in cheeks, all the wonderful signs of age, right? And the leatheriness of his skin, as though he's been exposed to the sun. The Romans loved to carve things with lifelikeness. It looks like a man that you may see walking down the street today. And people often ask, what happened to that talent? Did the Christians lack it? Well, there's a couple of reasons why the change. You know, we look at the figure of Christ here, and we, identify, we can recognize it. It looks like a human figure, right? And then you realize it's Christ. But it lacks the, the details that make it lifelike. It lacks the idea that there's an underlying skeletal structure that gives definition to the way the skin is pulled over the surface, to the idea that there's soft muscle tissue underneath. And part of that reason is that Roman art, since the time of Augustus, try to imitate life as closely as possible. But then sometimes they try to make it more perfect. In other words, here's a portrait of Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. And, you know, you could look at a dozen portraits of Augustus and you could always pick him out because of his hairstyle, the shape of his eyes, the nose, the high cheekbones, little pointy ears, small face. But Augustus was probably 70 or dead when this portrait was made. And yet he's shown very youthful looking. And the reason for that is because the understanding was that the emperor was divine. Gods don't age, nor do they show human emotion. But what's going to happen a little bit later on, especially by the time we get to Vespasian, who comes after Nero? And that's important because this is about propaganda. Vespasian doesn't want himself to be depicted like a god because he wants to get in good with the people. He wants to show the Roman citizens that he's like everyone else. Because you see, Nero had himself depicted in the manner of Augustus as a god. And we know the atrocities of Nero were so bad that even the Romans themselves couldn't accept it. The Romans would have assassinated him if Nero didn't himself commit suicide. So in order to rid Rome of the memory of Nero, Vespasian decides to have himself presented like a gentle, kind-looking, grandfatherly type, or your uncle almost even an expression on his face, very welcoming. And I say that because Roman portraiture will continue both styles, to make these emperors look like gods or to capture insight right, into the human state of condition. Here's a portrait of Caracalla, who was ruthless, savage, capricious, cruel, murderous, kills his brother. And you look at the expression on his face, we call it the Caracalla scowl, because they all look the same. There's a lifelikeness to him that's completely gone by the time we get to Constantine and to the earliest images in Christian art. The Romans wanted to, especially at the time of Caracol and before then, they wanted to imitate the world they lived in as closely as possible, the lifelikeness. Christians don't want to do that. They don't want to represent the world that they live in. They want to represent God's world. And their art is reduced to basic shapes. We say abstract. It lacks the refinement, it lacks that lifelikeness, it lacks the naturalism. And that movement towards abstraction was already starting with the time of Constantine. You look at Constantine's head here, it looks like a big block. The eyes are way too large for the rest of his facial features. But the emphasis was on his eyes looking upward to heaven. Remember, that was the source of his vision, the sign given to him, the sign of the Christ. So there's already a sort of a spiritualness about this here moving towards that abstraction. So I hope that answers the question that some of you have, but also like a lot of my students ask, well, did the Christians not have the talent? It wasn't a matter of talent. It was directly 
in opposition to classical art of the, say, the Greeks and then the Romans during the High Empire, rejecting that. All right. Quickly, I want to show you one more sarcophagus that's roughly around the same time as Junius Bassus's, and it has a similar subject here of Christ's um, narrative from the Passion, Christ carrying the cross with the help of Simon of Cyrene, Christ receiving the crown of thorns from the soldiers that mocked him, Christ here standing trial before Pilate. But what I want to focus on is this right here, the center. And remember, what I said is missing, oddly enough, from these scenes is the crucifixion. And we get this in the middle here. And what is this meant to represent? And what do we have pictured? We have the upright and the transverse of the cross. Remember, that was now a sign of the Christ and the Christian faith since the time of Constantine. Prior to that, it was a symbol associated with Roman execution. Constantine adopts it, takes on a no, whole new level of meaning. It's surmounted by that victor's crown, which encircles the chi and the row. Perched on the terminals of the transverse, we have birds. We talked about birds last time, birds of paradise associated with salvation, a covenant God made with his chosen people. But then underneath the transverse, we have these soldiers. One lit looks like he's sleeping. So what is it referencing? Is it meant to be the crucifixion? Is it meant to be the entombment? Because the Gospel of Matthew tells us that guards were struck with terror and became as dead men when the great earthquake, earthquake took place, when the Lord resurrected. I argue that it's meant to be the entombment, the crucifixion, or reference to it, the triumph over death, the resurrection, and the ascension all in one. And yet, there's no picture of Jesus there. Just the symbols associated with the paschal mystery and the message of salvation. Here are the guards, one that looks like he's fast asleep, the birds, the laurel wreath or the victor's crown, right, signifying the triumph, the chi, the row. And if you look even more closely, you see that this is the head of a bird. There's the beak, and that laurel wreath is in its, in its mouth. And there's the bird's feathers. And it looks like the great canopy of heaven, as though it is soaring upward into heaven. Well, is it meant to be the ascension? Perhaps symbolizes all of them. But just using a language of symbols that they borrowed from the Roman context and now put together in a uniquely new way to symbolize the Christian faith. It'll be a while before we see the crucifixion represented, and when we do, it brings us to this work, may not be what you would expect. Here's a little ivory plaque that's carved. It dates to the around 420. And it's one of several plaques that made up a little box into which something very precious was put, perhaps a uh, consecrated host. Here we have an image of Christ on the cross. And when I show you detail in a moment, you're going to see that his eyes are opened. Even though we have the centurion here mentioned in the Gospel of John with a lance, which is no longer there, piercing his side, from which then blood and water spouted, showing that he was indeed dead. Here, perhaps, John the Evangelist and Mary, the mother of Jesus, if we stick with the Gospel of John. But that's all. All the other details are not there. And there's lots of details in that long narrative. All right, we're counting the crucifixion. Yet just these were singled out. And to this side here, we have Judas hanging from a tree. He's dead. His head is thrown back. It looks like his neck is broken. His eyes tightly shut. And I'll show you details in a moment to see that. The way his hands hang and his feet hang, it looks like gravity has taken over, showing, in fact, that he is dead. Beneath his feet, the 30 pieces of silver in a little bag that he received for betraying Jesus. This figure of Jesus here we call the triumphal Christ. And that's the way in which the earliest crucifixion is shown. This is one of two surviving examples of the crucifixion that date to the early part of the 5th century, so around 420, and they're coming out of Rome. These are the only surviving examples from this time period that we have. And when they do, on, on, even on the other example, it shows what we call the triumphal Christ. Christ's eyes are open. His body looks intact. It does not look like a man who has suffered the crucifixion sentence, right? The execution by crucifixion. In fact, his torso looks almost perfect. And we think of a perfect sacrifice. And what that torso does is, is bring 
to mind the concept of the heroic in the classical world. In other words, the, the, the Greeks like to show heroes, warriors, athletes, gods, with a nude torso, and it symbolized heroism, dignity, and nobility. And now all of that is given over to Christ here. It symbolizes his, or becomes that triumph over death, over evil. It's not that the Christians denied the human suffering of Christ. They emphasized that, in fact, he was dead by including this little detail here. But they want to emphasize the triumph over evil. The plaque up here, Rex, King, Eudeorum. It's an abbreviation, King of the Jews. Here, by contrast, Judas is dead, eyes tightly shut. So whoever carved this really wanted to compare the difference between death of Judas and the life, eternal life in Christ. And there's the other detail. Again, think about it in terms of gravity, just pulling him down to the ground. All right. I'm going to show you the map here for a second again to kind of put things into a perspective. We talked about Constantine moving the capital from the west in Rome over to Constantinople. So what's going to play out over the next few centuries is that this eastern half of the Roman Empire is going to continue as the Byzantine Empire. Western part of the Roman Empire is going to dissolve, repeatedly sacked, as I said. And what's going to happen, right? What's going on over there? This map here, and don't worry so much about all the different names, but all of these colored routes and arrows are meant to represent the paths taken by the Germanic tribes, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Huns, the Vandals, who swept across the former boundaries of the Roman world and basically looted, burned, pillaged their way through the city, leaving a wake of destruction wherever they went. When they hit Rome in 410, they plundered it for three days. While that's happening in the 5th century, remember, the church is persevering. You know, the emperor's over in Constantinople, Eventually, he's going to send his son, Theodosius, he'll send Anarius over to Rome, right, to try to keep control. And that son of the emperor, he's going to have to come up with a, some kind of an understanding, an agreement with the bishop of Rome, right, to work together. But eventually, the emperor's son is going to leave the city of Rome, and he's going to go on to another city, a city of Ravenna on the Adriatic side. And the reason I say that is because the next monument we look at shows us what the image of Jesus looks like in the fifth century in an imperial context as it reflects the etiquette of the imperial court in Constantinople. And we're going to stick with a similar theme so we can get through this quickly. We have a mosaic of Jesus as the good shepherd. This is in a little um, oratory that was part of a larger complex of imperial buildings that was built in the city of Ravenna in Italy. And it shows Christ seated. He's wearing a long tunic. And the color here, even though it's not coming through accurately, is gold. And he has a purple sash. Imperial colors. The gold symbolizes his divinity. The purple, his royalty. The two coming together now. And then the gold halo. He holds the cross which is now with the staff has transitioned into the cross. And he sits in a field tending his sheep. And they all look peaceful, all looking in the direction of Christ. What's happened to the image of Christ since the time of the catacombs within the theme of the Good Shepherd, remember here we looked at last time, youthful, little tunic, like an adolescent. Now he's grown to a more mature man. Doesn't have a beard yet, that's yet to come. But now he's taken on the princely or the kingly attributes, the imperial attributes associated with the emperor now given over to Christ, king of kings. The purple, the gold, the gold halo, and the staff in the shape of the cross. The other thing that's playing out, too, is number symbolism. The Christians love their number symbolism. Notice there are three sheep to each side, three symbolizing the Trinity. The rock, boulder that Christ sits on are three levels. Father, Son, Holy Ghost becomes to symbolize it. But the rocks there, too, become a metaphor for Christ. The rock of the church, the cornerstone that was rejected, the tomb from which he resurrected, and the way in which altar tables were built. Right? There were certain um, requirements that the top of the altar table needed to be made of stone. 
and then Christ placed on that during the celebration of the Eucharist. And here Christ sits on the stone. So again, even in what looks like a natural type of a setting of a meadow with sheep grazing, has a level of symbolism to it that, once again, um, tells a story of the Christian faith and its doctrine. Even the palm branches here become symbolic. The palm branches associated with martyrdom or take us back to the entry into Jerusalem when the crowds waved the palm branches and shouted Hosanna or to the Feast of the Tabernacles when palm branches also played a very significant role in the Jewish worship. There's the inside of that uh, little chapel. We call it a mausoleum today, but it never functioned as a mausoleum. It wasn't a burial place for anybody. And as you can see, the entire ceiling and side walls are covered with that mosaic work. And the top part of the vault with the cross there in blue and gold meant to symbolize the universe where Christ presides. And they look like little snowflakes, but they're meant to be the stars in the great firmament of heaven. And this here, which looks like kind of mustard yellow, it's gold and the blue. And just to give you an idea, I mean, the amount of blue here, if we go back here for a second, blue was one of the most expensive colors to produce because it was made from lapis lazuli, which had to be exported or imported, I should say, to Ravenna in order to prepare uh, the pigment. But this was an imperial commission. Right, this was made for the daughter and son of Theodosius. Remember, Theodosius is the emperor back in Constantinople. He sends his son, Anarius, to Italy. And eventually, Anarius' sister, Galla Placidia, she'll join him in Ravenna. And this was most likely commissioned by her. We call it the Mausoleum of Galla Placidia, but it never functioned as a mausoleum. Most likely it was an oratory, a, a, a prayer chapel. All right, let me see. Just a, we're almost coming to an end. Just a few more minutes if you can bear with me. You're probably thinking, how can she talk so long to an empty church? Really no problem at all once I get started. <laughs> but anyway, I'm having a good time. I hope you're enjoying it. All right, what I want to do is show you one or two examples now. What's going on on the other side? There was Ravenna over here, but we're going to go clear across the map. There's Constantinople, but we're going to take it down here to this area of Egypt, which some of you may recognize as the peninsula where Mount Sinai is. Because what's going to happen there is the uh, construction of a monastery. Today it's known as St. Catherine's Monastery, which was a major source of icon production. For some reason, I'm having trouble advancing my slide. There we go. Okay. So what I'm showing you is a view inside the museum of that monastic complex at the, say, the, the, the bottom of that hill, uh, of, of the Mount Sinai, associated with the uh, narrative of Moses and the Ten Commandments. There was a monastery founded there by around 530. That monastery obviously has been built up since then but it is one of the oldest in the world, over 1,500 years. And that became a major center for the production of icons. Icon refers to, in this context, as a wooden panel that's prepared with pigment and has an image of Christ, Christ and Mary, Christ, Mary, and saints, or any combination of that. But it was meant to be used to help one focus in prayer. They don't necessarily have a narrative, a story, but rather the concept. And the two ways in which Jesus is represented with these icons, so there's a little baby held in the arms of his mother, and I'll show you details in a moment, and then as the Pentocrator, the almighty judge. So as a little baby, and then as a full mature man, and there he has the beard. And these images coming out of Mount St. Catharines on Mount Sinai there, are going to then spread throughout the rest of the Eastern half, the Byzantine Empire, and also into the West and feed into that pool of imagery. And once again, we'll see another development in the way Christ is represented. And the other thing, too, to realize that why are these subject matters chosen? Why the Pentocrator? Why the Teotokos? Well, once again, in response to the heretical factions that were starting to spread again. In other words, those that were denying the dual nature of Jesus, the hypostatic union, or Jesus' divinity and humanity, two in one, two distinct natures in one person. And by confronting that visually, right, this is the iconic image that we have, or the icon that we have. If you look at it carefully, right, if we were to draw a line straight down the face there, 
This side is very different from this side. You have two very different appearances. And that was meant to represent the two very different natures. And if some of you were here, I would ask you, do you know which is which? But I'll have to answer my own question. This side here is the divine. This side here symbolizes the human. And or so, put another way is Christ's right-hand side, we look at, it's on our left, but we always go by the perspective of God the Father or Christ. So this would be his right side, this is his left. And he's shown there with a halo. And very faint, you can see there's the four, ex, uh, three extensions, sorry, the sign of the cross. That halo is reserved only for the Christ or Christ's logos. Christ is God the Father. But it's part of the image of Christ now. He makes a gesture of blessing with one hand. And in the other hand, he holds the book of life. And that book of life records the names of those who will receive eternal salvation. And that book is covered with what look like expensive gemstones and filigree work. We're going to look at a similar book cover next time when we get to the Carolingian. But the point is, again, to show you this image of Christ the Almighty Judge in this, on this, this icon, which, you know, icons, there's a, a very... Um, explicit way that these are to be written, a tradition, age-old tradition that goes back to this time period. And even today, an official icon has to follow those guidelines. And it's a very prayerful process for the person who writes it or produces it. And that image of Christ Pentocrator will remain consistent throughout the ages. There's very little change to it, you know, to the symbolism, to the iconography of it. The other, oh, there's a detail of it. There have been some repairs made to it, this side over here, and you can see. But other than that, it's, it's in pretty good condition today. The other was the Teotokos, Mary the bearer of God. And there we have the little Christ child. He's wearing what looks like a gold robe swaddled in it. He's got a big halo behind his head with the sign of the cross. And in his little hand, you may not be able to see it. Let me see if I can zoom in. Is a scroll, the word, the word made flesh. And there you could probably see the, the halo a little bit better. Let me get out of that for a second. There's his mother seated like, you know, the princess. Christ child on her lap. She presents it for the faithful. She presents her son. She shows the way. And she herself becomes a chair. A chair for the word made flesh. Understood as the wisdom of scripture. And we often refer to this type of um, relationship of mother and child, not only as the Teotokos, the bearer of God, but as the throne of wisdom. The wisdom being the Christ child, Mary provides the throne. To her sides are Saints Theodore and George. They were Roman soldiers who were Christians and they were martyrs. So they become like the guardians and they invite the faithful to pray. To pray in the name of Jesus. The prayers will go up to heaven. The angels here are the messengers. So they transport the prayers up to heaven to God the Father. God the Father is represented by his hand, right, which just descends. That's how God the Father is represented in the Eastern tradition, just by a hand coming out of heaven. There's a ray of light which shines upon the Christ child, a direct access from the child to the Father. And the understanding is that God gave his only son incarnate. And then we pray in the name of Jesus to have our prayers heard by God, and then answered in the name of Jesus. And that's how those icons would be used in different types of um, worship and meditation and prayer, like portals, right, through which one can transcend the here and now and pray to the Christ. All right. There are the terms I mentioned. Throwing. The other thing, too, uh, Mary's role in art, both East and West at this time, is to show the way to salvation, Right? through her son. And very often you'll see her either gesturing to her son or pointing in, in other cases. Show the way to salvation. And that's what the monastery looks like today. Right, right there at the foot of the mount. And it's literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, originally it was referred to as the sacred monastery of the God-trodden Mount Sinai, but it gets the name of St. Catherine's Monastery because of the town nearby. Uh, I think it's uh, named after St. Catherine. All right, we're pretty much done with tonight's material, but I want to kind of just set you up for next week as a little teaser. We talked about now moving back to the West, right? The invasion of the Roman Empire. So we've made it to the 5th century, 6th century. And again, color-coded 
paths and arrows which show all the different migrating tribes that are going to sweep across the former Roman world. Not only do we have the Germanic ones, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Huns, the Vandals, right? We get our word vandalism from that. Gives you an idea of what they did or left behind. But we also have up north, the Angles and the Saxons. You've got all these people moving about. There's chaos, there's anarchy, there, there's illiteracy. Add to that the bubonic plague, which wipes out more than half the population. Yeah, you know, we refer to that time period as the Dark Ages. And I don't like that term. I tell my students I'm not happy with that. But what's going to eventually happen, those Germanic tribes and the Angles and the Saxons, they're all going to land. They're going to settle down. And they're going to basically give shape to what will eventually become the modern nations of Europe, right? France, Germany, Italy, and so on. And you can see how that's playing out here. And I'll show these maps again next week. At the same time, those migrating tribes are sort of settling down. We also have the spread of Islam, all right? Moving in, coming through Africa, crossing Africa into Spain, and eventually their expansion will be stopped by a Frankish general, Charles Martel. Charles Martel will have a grandson who's named the same, Charles. But he'll go down in history as Charles the Great, or Charlemagne, as he's known through the literary title. And that's where we'll stop for tonight and bring up part three next week with Charlemagne and the spread of Christianity in the West. So out of all that confusion and chaos and Ill illiteracy, Charlemagne is once again going to restore order, dignity, and literacy. He's going to create an alliance with the church in Rome, and we're going to see how that unfolds next week. So... Thank you for tuning in tonight. I wish you a blessed evening, a peaceful night's rest, and hope to see you next week. Thank you.